the Hedgeless Horseman here. It's January the 26th, 2024. First of all, thanks to my sponsors. Uh, I have now added Altamira Gold and Stillwater Critical Minerals. I really like both of those stories. Um, anyway, let's go on. Okay, so I, I will try to be somewhat quick i got so much stuff to cover and and i didn't even include everything because i i constantly get ideas and then i forget some and yada yada so it's like in a week i i have you know i i see a comment i i see a stock i, I think about whatever concept and it's like oh this is a good idea to cover in a video but it takes a lot of time to do these videos. Uh, I get really tired after you know, speaking English for over an hour, which typically happens, that uh, it's hard to do one of these every single day, unless it's something very specific. And of course, I want to try it to be somewhat coherent. Uh, so I gotta actually, you know, prepare uh, for every video. So, I mean, it, it, it's certainly a, a few hours of work and uh, I mean, I like doing it. I actually enjoy discussing or, or trying to, let's say, teach about investing. That's the one thing I enjoy the most uh, because I, I mean, I, I don't really get paid to do any of this. Uh, I mean, I cover some uh, sponsor companies, but they don't pay me to do videos or write anything. They're just uh, passive banner sponsors. Uh, but yeah, I don't know why. I, I, I just enjoy it. It's like I, I think I like to help people. Uh, and it's just, I mean, the worst thing in my opinion about the bear market is just that there's so many that, you know, seem to suffer. And especially given that the more you think, I mean, we talked about this before. Is a bear market a good or a bad thing? I would say it's like, you do not want to have a constant bull market where everything is fairly to overpriced. In that case, yeah, you might have, you know, some steady returns because things just get more and more overvalued. But, I mean, in a bull market, the big opportunities are, are already gone. And I've talked about this before. I mean, you should really be buying when almost everyone agrees it's a bull market and you should be selling if you... I, I'm very bad at selling, as I've said before, uh, but it's like here everybody's convinced it's a bull market, right? And that's, of course, closer to the end of it. After five years of a bear market, everybody knows this is a, I mean, look at this. Everybody can see that's a bear market, even in, I mean, in daily it shows up better. I mean, when you're down here, it's like, from i mean let's see you see this say of course it looks like a never-ending bear market and this looked like a never-ending bull market and that's the thing i mean if you only did that i mean almost everyone uh buy science sells low because they think that everything will just i mean you can't fathom what a bull market feels if you've never seen one. You can fathom what a bear market feels if you've never seen one. And around these tops and bottoms, everybody thinks, well, 95%, that this time is different and this time there won't be. I mean, a cyclical sector is not going to be cyclical this time around. And I had uh, some good discussions with... Uh, some people recently now i forgot what i was gonna say uh anyway, anyway i mean the the gist of it is like i know there's a hundred percent not not 99 not zero hundred percent guaranteed that there's going to be a bull market in junior miners and i also know how much juniors tend to go up in bull markets a lot and they're very very low so even a 100% jump is really nothing in a lot of cases. They would, a lot of juniors wouldn't even be at fair value, even close to fair value after a 100% bounce. And of course, in a full-blown bull market at the peaks, they will be way, way over fair value. 
they might be multiples of fair value, uh, long-term fair value. That, that's how this sector works. Like they get way undervalued at bottoms, way overvalued at tops. Uh, obviously you want to buy cheaper. So, uh, so, I mean, when you think about it, if you only, I mean, if you set a rule, a strict rule, and I'm talking like long-term rule over 20 years, whatever time you needed for a cycle to play out. Because like now I know people say, well, I, I'm almost down on everything, or I am down on everything. And if you entered in the last three years, that's not even surprising. That is, that's not proof of anything. And I also had a debate with someone on Twitter about this, that uh, I get shown, you know, Eric Sprott's portfolio of him being down in on most units around 50% over the last year or something. And that's proof that this market is hard. It's, in my opinion, actually not proof of it, anything at all, except that uh, most units go down in a bear market. But the flip side of that, if you take, if you would take the exact same stocks, uh, but you started from here or here or something. And this is obviously gold, not miners, but to make a point. I didn't have a single stock in junior miners that was down from this period to this period. So if you use why this sector is hard, uh, or if you have a portfolio and everything is down from this period to here, and you say, well, that's proof it's a hard sector. In that case, you have to say from this period to here or from this period to there or whatever, if everything is basically up hundreds of percent, then, then that's also proof that it's an easy sector. So the question is, which is it? Is it easy or is it a, a hard sector? I would say it's easy if you have a long term perspective and some common sense. Uh, and by long term, I mean, you know, probably three, five years at least. Well, obviously we've seen that three years is not even enough because you can have a one-sided bear market for three years. So that's not even enough. But five years, I mean, you typically see funds, etc., cetera, active, actively manage funds, the good ones. We have one in uh, Sweden, for example, there's like they is write that in the prospectus or, you know, on the corporate uh, information slide or whatever. It's like, you should only invest if you have a minimum like five year time frame. Because that's how long it needs for them to uh, uh, outperform, if you know what I mean. And they can promise it's going to be a, I mean, if you if your time frame is one year, uh, maybe you'll invest in a bear, it goes down, you sell out when you shouldn't. And that's obviously why, what, why these people, if they're good, actually activist investors, they don't want you taking out money when you should be buying and where they, when they want to buy. Uh, so that's one thing, it's like people f uh, make it feel, or I mean, we're so short-sighted, we're so impatient that a year feels like an eternity, but a year is really nothing. I didn't know this was gonna be a three year bear. Uh, but the thing is again, that the curse comes with the gift. If you have a three year bear, it means that after three years, the sector has at least never been as cheap in the last three years and probably longer than that. I mean, I think some juniors are probably at least cheaper since 2015, maybe earlier than that, meaning that this is the best you know, buying environment an investor has seen in like minimum eight years. So again, is that a good or a bad thing? Of course, that's based on what you do. I think it's the most obscene buyer's market I've ever seen. And for every day it has gotten cheaper, it just becomes more obscene. And somebody asked me about stop losses. Why I, I've never used stop losses. Why should I use stop losses? Let's say you buy something. You've done your due diligence. You think it's worth 2x now. You think it might if things go well. Let's say it's an expiration company or they have some alpha to grow over the next two years. You think they're worth 2x now what you're paying and you think they could be worth 5x of the current price in two years that stock goes down three percent uh, 30 percent let's say and and you have a stop loss there so you sell out why did you sell out if you're a value investor it's like did you sell even cheaper 
because you were afraid it's, it could become even cheaper than that. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, I, so I never understood. If you're a trader, that's a completely different thing. If this was some kind of pattern, I mean, the funny thing in this case, this was a false breakdown. So, I mean, I, I, that's one reason I don't like trading. And I remember saying that. It's like, that's what this sector does typically. I mean, a lot of fake, fake break, uh, breakdowns, uh, breakups, if that's even a word. Uh, but to me, that doesn't make any sense. As a value investor, it's like you imagine, you know, Warren Buffett, who owned uh, like had almost everything in Coca Cola back in his early days because he thought it was that good of a company and he bought every week. I assume if that got cheaper, it just means that his for the dollar invested, he will own even more of Coca Cola. He would be even richer today if the time at the time he bought 60 years ago, whatever. It, you know, he would make even more money if the market for a period of time uh, priced it even lower. So he could buy a higher, higher percentage ownership for his dollars. Uh, uh, anyway, okay. So there was a comment here on uh, one of my videos. Like Eric Landin have uh, private placement warrants and are loaded with cheap shares. Retail investors have a 50% have a dilution over five Years so they can hardly relate to each other. I don't exactly know what I mean. He means uh, by that, but so this is Philo Mining, Landin Jr. This is the publicly traded share of Philo Mining. Uh, did you uh, any anybody could have bought this at any point in time? Did you need cheap shares uh, in a private placement or? warrants to make money on this i mean it's a rhetorical question obviously not and the thing is that yes let's say or, or i should say will landines make more than you yeah i mean they were in from the beginning that's a given but th that's like just because someone can make more money than you doesn't mean that you can't make money on it. You didn't need warrants to, you didn't need to be in a private placement to make money on this. You didn't need warrants to make a lot of money on this. You knew the Landines are in and, and that's like, you know, third party validation. In this case, I mean, it's literally them, their teams running the show. You know, they have a threshold of like they want to find world class stuff. So, you know, we're, they're always after or typically after billion plus uh, billion plus prices. If you just held, and of course it sounds easy, but it's like, I mean, take this stock as well. I mean, yes, we, of course it's hard to know when they were gonna make a discovery, but here you have, you know, years of no uh, of flat to downward performance. Then boom, and of course like, uh, I've talked about a lot. Let's say you sell on a double or whatever. It's like, okay, you you invested here for whatever reason. Let's say you invested here. Uh, well, pro well, they were probably already onto something. But it's like, then you would sell out here. Half your stuff would so uh, sell out here. And uh, it would have gone up another 318%. And of course, you have this thing of uh, if you don't quote want to chase or whatever, you wouldn't even buy this. So I mean, just going back to some of these rules, some people have that uh, really makes no sense. Uh, if, if this went up like this on no news, yeah, I, I can see why you don't, let's say, want to chase. Because as far as you know, nothing has changed. Price has gone up, means less upside, more downside. You need a higher chance of success because you're going to get paid less in uh, if success happens. Uh, so you have to have a bit of a higher accuracy. Yes, that's true. But uh, if if this came with a let's say a pop here with some outstanding news like you know this uh, discovery hole, major discovery, uh, you should probably be buying, not taking half profits or use the rule that I'm never going to chase whatever. Here we have NGX, also a London company. 
this is again the publicly traded vehicle of NGX. Anybody could have bought this stock. Did you? Uh, did only people with quote share uh, cheap shares, uh, cheap shares or uh, warrants make money on this stock? No, this is obviously the publicly listed vehicle. Uh, anybody who had a brokerage account could have bought this stock as well at any point in time. And the, kind of the same goes here. That And, and this, uh, I was going to say, uh, you have the Landin, so you know, you know, the, and, and I think NGX, if I remember correctly, they already had, had a pretty fat deposit. But what do you, what do you give a good management time, time? management team time team a good team makes time held very positive or positively skewed because they will create value and solve problems the longer you give them the longer they can uh, make good decisions it's like uh, i've said this before let's say you have you give warren buffett and some random dude one day uh, for their respective portfolios to perform 50-50% uh, chance that Warren Buffett will actually outperform uh, the random guy. Six months, maybe, I don't know, I mean, depending on how bad, uh, let's say, a person is, uh, maybe 70% chance that Warren Buffett will outperform. And we're talking maybe, you know, against the total random. But give those people... 10,000 and, and they, you know, uh, see how their performance differs over 10 years. Warren Buffett will obviously have blown away, probably blown away the other guy. The other guy will probably be broke. And if you give a management team, a good management team, one day to create value, I mean, you're trading the stock, basically. Uh, then you're not even capturing that alpha that comes from management uh, qualities. If you give the Landin team three years, uh, they have a much higher chance of finding something worthwhile than a crappy team. Maybe a crappy team, I mean the typical junior team will have 1% chance of actually finding something, uh, you know, wherever in the world and proving that up. Maybe the Landins, you know, have 40% you know, chance. I mean, it's just ridiculous their hit rate. And you can't capture that hit rate by giving them one day or trading the stock or yada yada. So if you just use the fire and forget thing with Landin companies, some might not be, uh, n none of them might be up on a one year basis. Hold those companies for five years and you can see what can happen. Some of them will be absolute monster, multi, multi, multi baggers. Uh, and, uh, you know, some might be relatively even. I mean, this is Fireweed. This is when Landins went in. And I, I purchased some not long after. And I also bought for the family portfolios. Uh, again, I didn't get in with cheap shares. Didn't get in with any warrants. Uh, that position is uh, uh, in, the, in the green. And you have... Same with NGX, same with file of mining. You have many corrections, and and it might look like much, but it's like this is eighty two percent return. This is one hundred eighty two. This is what I'm talking about. It's like value shuffling and volatility. P people see volatility and a ne negative share price movement as bad by default, but that's because most people have no idea what they own. And they also always have a short. Uh, term time frame and it's basically guess the price tomorrow that's why people sell the lows because they think that tomorrow is going to be uh, it, it's going to be lower tomorrow because it's been low for the last x amount of weeks or months or whatever uh, but at the uh, same time if the case is intact the payoff just increases 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 so you need you need to be even less right you need to have a lower hit rate the cheaper something becomes obviously that's why i love bear markets uh, there's so some of the stuff out there is so cheap that I think that some will end up being successful. And if they 
grow for three, five years, they could become 20 to 50 baggers from these levels. That's what I think. Uh, near the highs in a market, I mean, imagine trying to get a 50 baggers, baggering juniors from here. When sentiment was red hot, juniors were probably the most overvalued they've been uh, in the last, I don't know how long, but long time, maybe at least since 2008, because I think that was pretty hot. But this, uh, if from talking to people, this was like epic levels of bullishness. How many stocks do you think made a 50 bagger from here? Uh, from these lows, uh, there's probably, a f I, I don't know how many are around uh, still, but it's like you have a lot, an extremely, uh, extremely higher chance of getting a 10 to 50 bagger buying in this environment than buying here. So you need less and less, maybe one stock that ends up proving up the blue sky case pays for 40 juniors that goes down 50 percent if you held them here it's almost impossible to get a 10 to 50 bagger from here because i mean let's say a, a june you might be buying the same junior here for 80 million which you can now buy for 10 million. I, let's say identical fundamentals, just extreme difference in sentiment. I mean, one eighth, let's say. So if they have the same kind of, I mean, identical blue sky scenarios, this will pay off eight times more, all else equal, than this. That it's just absolutely extreme how good some uh, many bets become in a bear market. So if you're a if you're a bad investor, you can certainly not afford to sell out in bear markets, especially deep in bear markets, because that's your biggest edge, absolutely biggest edge, where your hit rate needed uh, over the next three years is like one eighth of what it might be in a, in a hot uh, market. Um, and and this is uh, I was just thinking about this stuff yesterday. I think it was yeah yesterday. I uh, it's like I was sitting there just looking at all the opportunities out there and just felt like I was going insane. It's like I have no idea. I mean, getting you know my greed levels right or nowadays or ten out of ten. I cannot believe. I cannot believe that there. I was gonna you know see opportunities like we're seeing now. It is absolutely bonkers. I uh, is uh, um, the only frustrating thing for me is that I'm as always fully invested. If someone gave me twice the amount of money I have. I would put that money in the market right now as soon as I can. Because I think I am, I feel very very underweight junior miners, and uh, and I'm still all in. But I promised myself never to use leverage. But that's a, if you can be bullish, I mean, if you're super bullish after a three year bear, I mean, imagine how by definition contrarian you are. How many people out there do you see are actually bullish on juniors right now? Almost no one. And everyone or a lot of people, they throw out, let's say, excuses. So uh, take this, uh, for one thing, it's disconnected from reality. That's true. But again, that's if, if that is good or bad, that's that totally depends on what you do. And I've shown this example before where you have a 70% bear market and then it uh, goes up and reclaims uh, all the lost ground. You have three different people. One, one sells the low. He's minus 70%. He's out of the game. That's his investing career. One holds through the low. And he makes back his money. One buys the low. He actually makes money uh, over the full uh, cycle. Same bear market. Three different decisions. Totally different outcomes. And do that over the long run. I mean, yeah. Again, it's not the markets per se. It's what we do. So it's like we have to. And that's something everyone should really, really work at. Throw away all excuses. Most of it is just copium or it's like, you know, I mean, confirmation bias. Like, oh, it doesn't work because of this and that. And 
whatever. It's like take full responsibility. To me, I, I like the challenge of everybody thinking this sector is so bad and it's so hard. I mean, it's hard because we're humans, but when you think about it, it's like it's it's a cyclical sector. So despite that it's a cyclical sector, every single extreme, everybody forgets that it's cyclical. So if, if you forget that it's cyclical, then God help you. I don't know how you're going to make money. Because you're going to assume that every bear market lasts forever and you're going to sell the more the lower it goes because you're going to get more convinced that it's going to go low forever and you're going to buy high. I mean, that that's also always what happens. Anyway, if gold goes up, miners don't necessarily go up. That's true. We've seen like margin compression. And if someone asked me, uh, hey, what do you think the juniors are going to be trading at when gold hits $2,000? I mean, if somebody asked me that in 2016, when uh, miners were kicking ass at 1300 gold, I, I, I thought I would, I don't know, have a yacht or something, uh, $2,000 gold. And still we have some of the worst sentiment in like 20 years. Did I predict that? No. Did, would anybody have guessed that? I don't think anybody would have guessed that. But here we are. So you can, you know, one can bitch about it and all of a sudden it's like, you should always know what to do. And thankfully, again, I'm a value investor, so I don't care about fortune telling in terms of macro stuff. It's like I have one buying criteria. That's if something is cheap. I don't care why it's cheap. I don't care what people think is going to happen. I mean, it's typically uh, cheap because People think that what's bad right now, whatever, is going to continue forever, which it never does. So that makes it very easy. I don't use any guesses where gold is going to go in the short term or anything like that, or how the GDX looks or GDXJ. I have one setting, that's value investing. It's If it's cheap, I'm buying and holding until it's not cheap or I find something cheaper. Uh, because, yeah, if gold goes up, the miners don't necessarily go up. That's true. But a lot of the stuff is like, it's still, again, like worthless information. What do you do with this? If gold goes up, the miners don't necessarily go up. Well, one thing it shows is that even if you knew where gold was going to go, even if you paid money for a gold price, uh, uh, what would you call it? Uh, projecting uh, uh, trade specialist, whatever. It's like, oh, gold is going to go away. Even if gold did that, if you were in miners and you're thinking that's the, how I get leverage, you would still lose. So the question is, what do you do then? No, I stick to one thing. I'm invested in juniors, junior miners, and that's why I only care about junior miners. I don't try to predict gold because I know that e even if you're right on where gold is going in the short or medium term, uh, you can still end up losing and then you don't know what to do. Because that was your buy condition. Well, I thought gold was going to go from, you know, 1800 to 2000. So I held my juniors for that period of time. Okay, gold hits 2000. Let's say now you don't know where gold is going to go. What do you do with your juniors in that case? You sell because the trade is over? Maybe. But that just, I mean, in my opinion, highlights why uh, stock picking and just sticking to one thing, just looking at one thing is the way to go. I don't, I didn't predict gold was going to go to 2000 when it did, uh, uh, or that juniors would be where they are now. I just react to what the offers the market gives me. And this market is the most batshit crazy I've ever seen probably. And if an exploration company drills an amazing hole, the stock sells off. No thanks. That doesn't sound like someone who uh, wants to be a buyer in this environment. Because he gave three excuses and his conclusion. I mean, this, for example, disconnected from reality. Yeah, I mean, the the... If you listen to any, you know, Warren Buffett or whatever, any value investor, what's their ideal buying scenario when something is disconnected from reality? So he's actually, I mean, he's pointing out a good thing. It's like, yes, this is a condition. 
you would want to see if you were to pick up something cheap. That is disconnected in this case. Reality being that it's worth more than its price right now. Okay, great. Now we have a buy condition, an excuse to buy. If gold goes up, the miners don't necessarily go up. I mean, you can't do anything with that anyway. And it doesn't mean that it's never, ever, it's forever going to be so. It just happens this uh, this time. That's what has happened. That's why they're cheap. Gold is up, but they're still cheap. So it, it's not really a call to action on anything. It's just a statement of fact. Um, uh, you know, l let's say a, a non <coughs> a non -re relationship or non correlation that uh, just happens to be true right now. If an exploration company drills an amazing hole, the stock sells off. Again, is that good or bad? For holders, it's, and I've talked about this a bunch of times, for holders, it's very punishing to uh, be investing in a, a bear market. And I'm 100% invested all the time. Because as a holder, at face value, you're taking on risk with little to no chance of reward. Because in this case, like he's explaining, a company drills an amazing hole, the stock sells off. I, I mean, that's obviously up to definition, like an amazing hole and the stock sells off. I mean, may maybe, let's say a company drilled an amazing hole where everybody knew there was gold already. I mean, there's a lot of context. We can't just say that. I mean, if somebody drills an amazing true discovery hole, even in this sector, I think it's not going to sell off. Uh, you can just see what happened with Hercules, for example. So it's like uh, there's got to be a lot more context. It's like ha uh, some some crappy junior drills a crappy product where there's no chance that there's ever going to be even a big price. If they drill, quote, a, you know, amazing hole, um, may maybe it makes sense that the market shouldn't react that much. Uh, but... Furthermore, on that note, yes, as a holder, and I'm a holder 100% of the time, it's very punishing because even if you take on as a risk, uh, which you do all the time if you're in, in exploration companies, not just pre-discovery, but obviously the, the, the ongoing discoveries, they are also very volatile because some holes will be better, some will be worse, yada, yada, etc., etc., uh, but I can also become a buyer. That's the thing. That's how I offset the skew, or, or let's say that the market is called rigged against holders right now. And and uh, furthermore, I mean, I've talked about this before. I mean, right now, the cheaper this sector goes at these extremes, I, I think bank success, beta is actually going up a lot in risk reward that they are becoming better buys than the alpha place, because in the alpha place, especially in a pre-discovery story, you still have an if question. And that might be a very long, you know, a long shot. Or if they don't have anything, they're trying to find something, uh, there might be a pretty or very high chance they won't find anything. So even if the market turns around, they've just killed the project, what are you supposed to, what, what's the market supposed to revalue if the target is killed they have nothing they don't even have a sniff of anything they don't they have any hope people can buy into uh, that's what's the downside of alpha place right now but again you're also a buyer so if you have 20 stocks you see five of them put out good news you took the assay risk let's say uh, uh, five of them did well And you have some other stocks that have has not given out any news, so they haven't really reacted. Maybe they've traded sideways. But all of a sudden, these five that put out news had their value go up and no price reaction. So the price to value gap uh, got wider because value just went up, but price didn't. So by definition, from a value investor, even you know a, a speculator, high risk world speculator, so so the the implied or risk adjusted future value just went up because they de-risk something, whatever. Uh, that means 
they just went up in in if you liked them before they just became even better buys the the uh, other side of that coin is of course if if value is fixed and price goes down that means there's a price to value gap widening as well it's just that value stayed the same and price went down so i mean there, there's a bunch of different scenarios where you can do value shuffling it not, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with uh, news day it just has to do with volatility or lack of volatility when there should be volatility so uh, point being that uh, if you see i mean again and this could be put in the category of disconnected from reality. And again, is that good or bad? Well, if if you held something, so it go into assays. They drill a good hole, the stock sells off. So you're down on paper. Uh, okay, and, and then you're like, no thanks. So you sell out because you, you weren't paid immediately. But then there's another guy who's like, oh, they, that hole was actually good. I ha have no, let's say, investment in this stock yet. Or I had one and I'm down 30%, but it should be up even more now since they increased their value. So that person adds or buys into it for the first time. How do you think that's going to play out in the long game? One who sold because he was frustrated that there was no reaction and never buys into juniors because he's frustrated about the lack of reaction. Or someone who's actively or is acting upon the disconnection from reality that's ongoing in the market. He's stealing value left and right, reshuffling. Oh, this company put out news that's obviously good, hasn't reacted, buy some of that. Okay, this uh, uh, junior that went down in price, no, uh, 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 no, let's say, value has not gone down so the price to value gap the widens for that reason i'll buy some more of that thank you very much i mean one guy you know throws up their hands and is like nope junior's not for me because i don't get paid immediately the other one's like okay i see how the market is screwed up and i'm going to take advantage of that fact i'm going to use the volatility or non-volatility to my long-term advantage not be a victim of it. I mean, think about it. It's like, let's say you have 20 juniors and 10 of them put out good news, whatever, they all sell off and you sell. I mean, what, what does that make you if not a chump? If you're convinced, you think value went up, price went down, you should already know the answer what to do. And it's not selling because of frustration. So basically what I'm saying, if you, if you don't even know what, if you don't have a strategy that makes sense, why should you deserve to win? It's like, you know, you should earn returns. There's so many people I think out there, they're like, they're so spoiled or whatever. It's like, oh, they just assume that, oh, they're so special that they go into a sector or whatever. And you, you're just supposed to. The, the re returns are just supposed to come right at you forever, basically. It's like, as soon as I buy a stock, I should be rewarded immediately and forever. As long as I hold it. Without, I mean, basically buying on hope or it's like, you know, uh, trading sardine, last person in. I mean, most people don't have a plan. I mean, do, do you have a plan? I, 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 I have a plan and they can be very simple plans for every single stock i mean if you how do you do a case for file mining let's say they started trading you knew about it's like well uh the landines are in and they are some of the best explorers in the world and they know what success looked like and they're only after elephants so i'm gonna buy this stock sit on it forever either they're not gonna find anything or they're gonna find an elephant and if they find an elephant uh i'm gonna be up 1500 percent over what is this like uh, five six years yeah that's a pretty good bet is it very advanced no did you did you do any trading or 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 get shaken off or uh you know you don't even need to do value shuffling it's like in that case i mean again so the longer time you hold the stock i mean growth doesn't happen overnight so i mean obviously this is time passing here's value growing 
So if you hold a Landin company for a week or a month, it's like, should you, should you, uh, for whatever reason, do you deserve returns? What's, what was the plan to hold it for a month? Not really, right? Yes, let's say you bought when it was maybe going up. So you thought, I'm going to make money because it's going up. And then it uh, went down uh, 27% instead. And then you s s uh, sell out because, again, you were in it before you th thought it was going to uh, keep going up. You had no idea. You had no real plan. You had no s real strategy. And th that's why what most why most people fail. They, they, don't, they don't even know, in my opinion, why they should win and then they make up all these excuses while the ironic thing is they highlight the very things that I why I think this market is great so uh, same thing going back to the some people look at most people not, almost everyone look at bear markets like definition it's bad by definition it's bad what I'm trying and with the help of my friend by low is trying to uh let's say a show or whatever, is that it's ridiculous to say that a bear market by definition is bad. I mean, listen to all the great value investors. They love volatility. Warren Buffett loves bear markets for the simple reason that you can buy stuff cheap. That's the only reason. You can buy stuff for less than it's worth. And we can do that because it's the, they are disconnected from reality. If gold uh, miners, uh, uh, gold has gone up, but miners have not. Again, disconnection from reality. If an exploration company reels an amazing hole, the stocks sell off. So in that case, again, it gets cheaper. So it's just li listening, list, listing a bunch of things that a value investor would be out there looking for. And his conclusion is obviously the opposite of, of that. He doesn't see that at all. So obviously he's, he, um, he might think he is, but he's like, he doesn't fully understand what value investing is. But look at, look at the crypto accounts, whatever, or look at the macro accounts or putting out shorts, etc. It's like, yeah, I'm actually up to like 15,000 followers, but I'm nowhere near some of the, you know, more... Uh, put out the short, you're all gonna get rich kind of thing, or or crypto get rich quick thing. Don't even bother with due diligence. This sucker is just gonna go up because the halvening or what what the hell it's called. I mean that speaks to ninety five percent of people because nobody really wants to do actual work. Everybody thinks they uh, almost everybody thinks they deserve because it's arrogant to begin with to be a stock picker. You're saying, I think I can beat the market. And one would think that, okay, oh, you probably have a strategy of beating the market if you're so arrogant that you actually are a stock picker. But almost nobody has an actual strategy. If that makes sense. It's, it's just unreal. I mean, I, I, I'm very comfortable... I'm going to be super, super shocked if I'm not up a lot over the next five years. Because I think my strategy works really well, makes a lot of sense, and it uh, jives very, very well with bear markets. Because I know what happens when you buy something extremely cheap. One day they're going to revalue. I mean, that's it. That's why it's like I have no idea when the market is going to change or, or if it's going to get cheaper. Before that, I just know that there's going to be a bull market one day when we won't be able to buy metals in the ground as cheap as we do now. That's that's all I know. It's like Warren Buffett. It's like, you know, explain the... When he's asked basically to explain the intrinsic value, whatever, and he's like, no, for some, you know, magical machination, sooner or later, stuff ends up close to fair value. If it's way above or way below it at whatever, at a given time. So. Uh, uh, 
else or anymore. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, you can cover this as well. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, I think this is a great example. Uh, here, here you have someone who's seen it. I remember a research uh, put out in 2003 by the largest, largest Polish broker. I mean, foremost experts. With a sell recommendation for KGHM at uh, 3, I guess that's Slotis or something, at the very bottom of Copper Bear. What happened next? The stock went up to 150, Jesus Christ, within the next 10 years, paying over 10% yearly dividends. So effectively it wasn't 50x, but more like 150x. He basically sums up the high risk, high reward approach and why bear market investing is absolutely the most favorable uh, uh environment to be investing in especially the worse you are it went to 150 if you bought it at 100 there was a 50 it went up 50 percent if you bought it at three it went up 150 x in 10 years 10 years not one year two years three years five uh, ten years how many how many other cases that you bought could have gone to shit and this would still have paid for all of them. If you had 20 stocks, and this was one of them at 5%, held it for five, uh, 10 years, this would have, uh, I mean, not may, I was gonna say, uh, I mean, you would be up a lot in your portfolio if 19 out of 20 stocks went to zero. If they only went down 50%, made heck of a lot of money if if a few others actually went up as well heck of a lot of money so this this one stock over a 10 year period at well, again very bottom of copper bear do we know exactly when the uh, when the bear is in or when the the low is in no does it matter that much if you, uh, I don't have a, where's the, I can put up GDXJ maybe, GDXJ. Okay, I like, I prefer juniors, but anyways, like, I should have a, let's go with, wait, I'll do like this instead. You know my my handy sentiment indicator here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So okay, here you have. Um, here you have uh, uh, Bear Creek Mining, obviously. So it's like, let's say, and and this is obviously not the law, you know, uh, KGHM or anything, but it's like we're talking juniors who tend to be more violent, and it's like they don't, most of them don't even have a long lasting business like KGHM, so there's obviously a difference here. Uh, and it's like Bear Creek Mining. Is that worth anything? Was Has it been worth much? Maybe not, but it's still traded up a shit ton. So it's like, let's say this is the equivalent of, you know, the, the lo Polish, Poland's largest broker put out a, puts out a sell rec here or whatever. Close to the absolute bottom. It's like, okay, it went up 1591%. Did, did you absolutely need to catch the bottom? Was... was uh, KGHM at three slot this or whatever. Uh, was that the only bet? Like, yeah, 150% or 150 times your money or nothing? No, obviously not. I mean, even if, if you were even remotely close to the bottom in KGHM, you would have made money. And, I, and it's like, for me personally, I don't think the large miners are that cheap. I mean, it's not like they're just giving away free cash. They might be undervalued right now, or you know, thirty percent or whatever, fifty. But like, it's the juniors that I think are absolutely ridiculously. I mean, the juniors. Oh, jeez, sorry about that. 
here we have juniors like barracks and, and stuff like that is not trading down here so the, it's the junior sector that i'm seeing the opportunities in um, um, okay here the problem i have with setting something that's down 50 percent and buying something that should go up 100 percent is that it doesn't everything i buy goes down 50 percent I'm only a bunch of companies that never went up 100%. I think only 10% of my companies are up 100%. I can't put everything into my top 10 performance. I have to have myself diversified. I mean, I don't know when he got in, obviously. It's like you can take this and uh, uh, take this uh, comment here. You would not see a single person who entered this uh, the junior sector from any point in time from here uh, well maybe if they entered here or something it went down like that but it's like uh people who held for at least six months anywhere in this short pretty much up to the top would say the uh, uh, complete opposite that they they were up in everything and they can't find a stock that's down 50 percent uh then we go in the reverse bear market pretty much everything goes down and where are we now well since the last three years everything is pretty much down so it's like that's nothing to take personally i mean my goal given that it's like you know i try to convey to people that i don't know what exactly the average you know bull market throws off but there was plenty of companies that went down 500% to 1,000% over this period. Uh, from here, uh, Bear Creek went up um, 461. Here it was 2,000%. All we know, it's much more than 100%, okay? So it's like one goal. I mean, a starting goal, and you don't even need to hit it. It's like it would be really nice if you're not down 70% from if you invested here and they're down 70 percent it would be great if you're not the trick is however if you buy more that average goes down uh if you value shuffle a bit and uh, go from maybe some companies you own are down 50 to 70 percent uh, they're cheap but they should only go up 100 or something or could go up 100 or whatever. But you find companies that you think should go up 200 and could go up 600. Nothing happens at face value. Uh, 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 yeah, so like he says here, you break in, if you do a sequential blah, blah, blah. Uh, he's basically just saying, and, and I'm pointing that out, value shuffling does nothing, it sh doesn't show up in the short run. If I sold all my the stocks I have right now and buy uh, 20 or 30 or 40 stocks that I think are 100% better than what I sold, my, my portfolio would not have changed in the short term. But the future, future portfolio value might have gone from here to here all of a sudden. Because I did high grade my portfolio with better plays. More for my money. More future money for my current money. That stuff you can do. And the better you get, I mean, in my opinion, I'm a much better investor today than I was three years ago. So you had, have had three years of learning. Three whole years. You should have been gotten better at something. Three, year, three years more of getting better and better at investing and mining and stuff like that overall. Voila. Here you have the cheapest market we've seen since, I don't know, maybe two, early 2000. Can you come up with a much better, I mean, the return on money invested now is probably never, a future, future return on money invested now has probably never been higher in the last 20 years. You had three years of learning. Even if you're down a lot, dry powder makes it, I mean, if, if you're down, if you have a portfolio start off with like 10,000, let's say you are down 7,000, 70%, you could double that portfolio by a $3,000 investment. So in one way, it's like if you had uh, quite, you know, 
little money or whatever and you're down a lot i mean at least it's it's very easy to supercharge the future returns because the dry powder uh uh it doesn't take a lot of dry powder right now to completely change the future of that portfolio so again it's like people's you know call a bear a curse what i mean the, the thing is that the bear market is the remedy and the and the curse it just it depends on what you do like i said before if if you have a market that goes like this and i mean if, if bear creek mining is still around it's gonna probably be trading quite a bit higher than this when we go into a higher sentiment environment and this should be no surprise because that's what this sector does crashes and rallies crashes and rallies so if you have again one person three uh, or three people buy in here one sells down here one holds all the way to up here and one buy, uh, one goes down here and he buys he'll be up here the holder will be here maybe and the seller will be stuck at minus 70 percent because he's already out same bear market three different decisions during the bear market where the depths of the bear market outcomes completely different and do that every time for 10 years or 20 years or whatever this guy is just he uh, this person's who I mean who knows how his portfolio goes maybe slide down if we can for like uh, <laughs> dilution and uh, let's say subpar stock picking or not even I mean it, there is a lot of dilution like that maybe this guy he's chronically at minus 70 if he the more he plays the less he will have because he's gonna do the same thing again but this person uh, after every full cycle he will actually be up so over the long term he's actually gonna ha have uh, he's gonna make money in this sector if, if you gave these people the exact same trading sardine let's say and maybe some I mean you would like some growth so it's just not a pure trading sardine but anyway, if this guy just buys more during the lows, I mean, it would be even better if he sells some at the highs. I don't do that, but I'm not in trading side sardines either. I mean, my portfolio goes more like this. And it's like in a given year, I have no idea what, you know, if I'm going to be up or down. Give me five years. There's no way I'm down, basically. Uh, yeah, so I, I just hope it makes sense. But the, the, the most important thing, again, is that do not blame the market. Because the, the, the things you blame the market or that the market is stupid, which I think it is, is the very reason why you can beat it over the long term. Over the long term. I'm not talking necessarily a year, not even maybe two years against like uh, Philo Mining. Ask someone... Uh, here or you know who who has been in philo mining from where can i uh, this period he would say well i don't enjoy this at all and and from here i don't enjoy this at all or or here to here or here to even there it's like i don't enjoy this at all from here to here you get the you know you know what i mean but like over the long term with the simple case that hey it's the landines they're gonna create value they tend to uh, at the end of it if they have success they sell it okay so one could come up with a pretty simple case i'm gonna buy some of philo mining or whatever landing company new landing company i don't know what the chance of success is but i know they're hunting for elephants one billion plus let's say i'm paying 50 million for it or, or whatever i think the chance of success is 10 so it's actually 50 percent cheaper than it should whatever it's a buy okay and the only thing and of course it can go a lot higher than that uh, and uh, since i mean final mining is at like three billion dollars and we're not really even in a mining bull yet so you know uh, get the idea i mean if philo goes to six billion that's i mean yeah that's a lot of returns anyway uh that's a simple case i'm just gonna buy this because Good management, 
the longer I have it, the higher the chance of success should be because it's a good management team. Uh, if they find something, the longer I hold it, the bigger it's going to get and all of that and all of that. That's a very simple, absolute brain dead easy thing. Of course, it's super hard to do the actual fire and forget because most people are going to sell every low, even though it's a success. Um, if you trade this, I, I don't know how you how well you're going to do. You might make some money, but obviously the, the, the dumb person who had one simple hodl strategy here, fire and forget, saw the case early said that, well, it's if they find something, they're probably going to sell it. That's how, how I exit this. It's a natural exit, so I'm not even going to touch the portfolio or whatever. Um, and maybe, again, it gets bought out. So in that case, that his plan, in this case, it worked. He didn't know it was going to work. But if he has 20 different similar stories, he doesn't need to do anything for, let's say, 10 years. And he's probably going to make a lot of money doing it. And you can say that for like 98% of juniors, obviously, because the Landines don't think everything is good. They think a few produce are good. Uh, so that that's, in my opinion, it's like, what's a good thing to do? Uh, dump down your strategy. That's what I think I talked about the last video. It's like, I like simple cases. If somebody can pitch me a story in like, three sentences or or should sum it up i mean that's good enough if somebody says like well you know they have this entity involved it's like a billion dollar company they're trading for absolute peanuts there's like no chance of success priced in so i thought i would just buy this and you know uh, theoretically come back in three five years either they won't have found anything maybe it's going to be down maybe it's even going to be to zero anyway up to 100 percent loss if they find something, uh, it could probably grow for a few years. So in five years, that's adequate time for if it pays off, it's probably going to have paid off a lot. And that's going to pay for many other failures. And it's so cheap right now that I only need one of these in 10 to actually work out in over the next five years to have it pay for the other one, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean... That is not a complicated thing. I mean, you won't know, Brian. I, I know how it is to want to do a bunch of research it's like when i write my articles i like to typically do long articles and look at a bunch of stuff but i also have just you know uh you know too long didn't read segment where or the short the case in short where it's just being summed up it's like it could be really big it's trading for only this i think there they have a 30% chance of actually, you know, making a big success. And then in that case, I'm going to be paid way more than I should because it's so cheap right now. I mean, that's how I think it should be. Most people don't even have a case. If you ask people, why do you own that stock? Maybe they'll say, you know, uh, well, because it's cheap. And that's true. But then they keep bitching about the stock not moving. I'm talking beta plays. Oh, it's not going up. It's not going up. Well, you bought beta, so beta is typically going to move when the sentiment changes a lot. So why are you bitching? I mean, I hope you knew why you bought it. Because if you're only in beta, the only thing you're waiting for is a change in sentiment. You have a lot of ounces for that you bought for $10 per ounce. You think they're going to be trading at $50 per ounce one day or something. Then the only thing really is to wait for it to trade, you know, close to $50 per ounce. That's it. Bitching about that it's not trading for $50 yet, that doesn't help anyone. It makes no sense because, you know, you should know what you signed up for. It might be a year from now. It might be two years from now before it trades at $50. $50. Some might be never. Some might trade at $100 when this really gets going. But still, it's like... At least have a plan and act like you have a plan. Because the more, if you bitch, you know you don't have a plan. I mean, I get being frustrated. It's like, yes, do I get... I mean, I get offended by how stupid the market is. I'm offended by it. So in that sense, yes, it is fr frustrating because you lose faith in humanity and all that. And of course... Sometimes you're like, you know, have big hopes, something happened, you thought it was going to happen, like gold going to 2000 or 
a company making this drill hole, uh, you know, they, they get some good assets and the, the market doesn't depreciate it at all. There's nobody in the market. There's no buying at all. It's like it didn't happen. Is that going to be frustrating? Of course it is. But still, you should always know. It's like, what's the long term game here? You should know if it's a sell or a hold or a buy. And the only thing you should be holding now are buys. Uh, so I guess it comes back it's like to the fact that please try to earn returns and please try to understand that if you're down in almost all of your companies from this period to here, that is nothing unique. That is nothing that almost is a given the same. And the, again, flip side of the coin, when the markets, when the junior sector does one of these, you're not going to be down on any on anything you 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 know from these levels. That's just how it is. I didn't make the rules. That's just how the stupid market works. That's how humans work. And like always, the more you buy low, the more you're going to make when we hit the high. That's it. Uh, I didn't have time to go through a bunch of junior news, but I'll do that in another video. This is already long enough. Uh, thanks for listening. If I talked about any companies, assume I own them, assume I'm biased, some are banner sponsors as well. This is not investing advice. You know, hit the like, subscribe button if you want to and, and you know, leave a comment uh, if you're asking about something. So, sometimes I think it's actually, you know, brings up good subjects. Uh, anyway, uh, hold strong again. It's like nothing, uh, last point, nothing has changed. Absolutely nothing has changed. I mean, when, when stocks, when juniors right now go up or down 20%, I mean, that's like wiggles on a, it's like, doesn't matter at all. Doesn't matter at all. If you have something that's a clear sell after going up 20% from these levels, you should, probably shouldn't have owned it in the, in the first place. That doesn't mean you can't do value shuffling. I'm just saying that it's a bit irrelevant to watch the markets that close right now, because for me personally, I'm waiting for the big payday, which might take, you know, a few years still. So until then, I just try to steal as much value as I possibly can, because I know that one day, and it's a 100% guarantee, that the juniors or minors will not be this cheap as they are now. Thanks for listening. Bye.